IT Insights, talks on business and IT challenges with tech leaders. Welcome to another episode of IT Insights podcast series. I'm Eva Banash, and today I have a pleasure to talk to Ed Morrison, a co-author of the book Strategic Doing, 10 Skills for Agile Leadership, a number one Amazon new release in six categories. For over 25 years, Ed has been developing new network-based models for strategy in open, loosely connected networks. These approaches emphasize the strategic value of focused collaboration and innovation in today's global economy. Great to have you here, Ed. Oh, it's such a joy to be here. Thank you very much, Iwa. My pleasure. Ed, could you introduce yourself a little bit to our audience before we move on? I'm I'm happy to do it. I'm I'm old enough so that I can make this introduction in terms of decades. Uh, so so my first decade after college, I was in Washington D.C. learning about policy, uh, implementing policy in two areas: one, globalization, and two, renewable energy. And uh, I thought I'd pursue that career. Got a master's degree in business and a law degree because I thought I'd go back to Washington. And I did go back to Washington. I became a, a senior uh, staff member of the Senate Democratic Policy Committee. So I was working with the Senate Democrats. But then I left Washington because we weren't really dealing with the globalization problems very well. I went to work in the second decade as a consultant, initially with a corporate strategy consulting firm that uh, I worked with General Electric, Ford, and Volvo. These were, this was an offshoot of the Boston Consulting Group. And then I went off on my own to understand how we could adjust to globalization pressures. This was a, placing enormous pressures on the U.S. economy. This, the third decade, which gets us into the 1990s, I'm focused really on developing a new approach to strategy because I had learned that strategic planning, what, what we used as strategic planning, didn't really work very well in a network-based economy. So in the early 90s, I had a conversation with a physicist, one of my client companies, uh, chief technology officer, and he uh, introduced me to one, the commercial internet, which was going to be coming uh, a couple of years later. And then secondly, he said, uh, study open source software development. So I did. I studied open source software development and spent about 10 or 12 years trying to figure out how do we do strategy in open, loosely connected networks when nobody can tell anybody what to do? How do we do that? By 2005, now we're in our next decade, in 2005, I went to Purdue University to learn how to validate this model. In other words, know that it works in a different setting. So we ran a bunch of test beds. And then uh, how to teach it? How do you teach it? How to, how, what are the skills and how do you teach it? In by 2015 or 16, we were pretty clear we had a model. Uh, I created something called the Agile Strategy Lab at Purdue, and we uh, published a book. We published a book, uh, which came out in 2019. I retired from Purdue and uh, went to the University of North Alabama, where I am now, where I, I do, I guide a, an agile strategy lab at the uh, university. But the big thing I did was complete a PhD in economics to explain why this works. Uh, so the PhD was really designed around why does strategic doing work? What, what's the reason, or what are the multiple reasons that, um, this process, this protocol actually works. And so I tied it back to various different research streams that scholars had done. So that's that's in a nutshell where I've been. That's been my journey. And now we are, it's an open source model. So we're distributing this and sharing it with whomever wants to be uh, more productive in their collaborations. They can learn some skills. And that's really what, that's what I really spend my time doing now is, uh, talking to young people who are dealing with really complex problems and uh, what what can I do to help them? Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's it. Thank you for that introduction. It, it is indeed a long story <laughs> yes. that you presented, but, but I love the journey that you took. And, you know, I love the fact that we can meet here today and discuss your foundings, actually. You mentioned that you were discovering why it actually works and you were like figure, figuring it out. And I doubt that you believe that strategic doing is the answer to the new challenges business face. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? 
Well, uh, part of the challenges, uh, there's several different parts of this. One, one is that the challenges we face, any business faces, are increasingly wicked problems. In other words, their problems are adaptive problems. They're problems we've never encountered before. Uh, obviously, the pandemic is one adaptive problem. Everybody had to adapt. So we are, we're confronting challenges that we don't really know the answer to. And so these these are wicked problems. These are problems that have many different sources, and, and, and there's no really simple way to address them. So it's not a technical problem like my car doesn't start. It's a problem that, that we've never encountered before. And increasingly, businesses are recognizing that to deal with those problems, they don't have all the knowledge inside the corporation. So there's, there's really a twofold problem here. One is that they've got to create multidisciplinary teams within the company cross-disciplinary teams within the company. And then secondarily, they have to create partnerships outside the company. So again, you're dealing with networks rather than a hierarchical structure. And so how do you do strategy in a network environment? And that's really what I've been studying since the early 90s uh, and developing a protocol around that. And, and so this is why companies are now focused on this. It initially started talking about open innovation in the early 2000s, uh, this has led to a focus on platforms, the idea of platforms and ecosystems. And so it's all related to our move, our industrial move from hierarchical, stable structures to more network, ambiguous, uncertain problems. And um, so you've got two levels of complexity you got to deal with. One is the complexity of the problem itself. And then the second is the complexity of the collaboration. The collaboration itself is complex. And so what we've learned is that in order to do strategy in that environment, you need to follow simple rules. And so the simple rules that we set out in strategic doing helps us do that. Good that you uh, mentioned those rules, because this is exactly my next questions. Uh, you teach those C-level executives, those PMs, the rules and skills of good collaboration, as you mentioned. And how is your approach different from the traditional one, the one that you encountered in probably the 90s or beginning on, or, or, of the new millennium? Yeah. Well, collaboration itself, uh, let me define that because, uh, again, collaboration is different than cooperation. It's different from command and control. It's different from even teamwork. It's different from the idea of teamwork. And why is that? Well, collaboration is a, as I define it and we define it, is an innovation process. It's an innovation process of recombinant innovation, of taking the assets we currently have available and recombining them to create new value. And this is a process that requires the development of trust across organizational political boundaries. And so it's a process that managers design and manage. And so it's not, it's not a thing. It's a process. It's a, and in the process, ironically, the process focuses on our oldest technology, which is our conversations. And why is that? Well, in 1994 or so, a really smart Harvard Business Review editor, a guy named Alan Weber, said, um, what's so, he asked the question, what's so new about the new economy? And of course, this is when networks were starting to evolve. The internet was just coming on. Knowledge economy and the idea of learning organizations and all that was starting to bubble up. And what he's found, which is true, is that the core technology or the core focus activity that managers have to design and guide is the conversation because that's how we generate and distribute our knowledge. Most of our knowledge is generated and distributed through conversation. The challenge, of course, is that uh, understanding what kinds of conversations, how do you design it, is a very tricky problem. And scholars have struggled with this for a long time. Management scholars have not done a very good job in understanding it because it's really tough. It's difficult to understand. And so it's not surprising to me that a practitioner like myself focused on it, developed a model that works, that can be replicated and scaled, that can, you can teach it. And so this, these are a set of skills. We identified 10 of them that you can practice in designing and guiding conversations. Now, the good news is that we find, figured out these skills and we can teach them. Uh, the good news is also that you're not going to be good at all, equally good at all 10 skills. 
But together, these skills form a discipline. They're interrelated. They're interconnected skills. Like, I don't know, learning how to swim is a set of skills, breathing uh, comfortably, you're using your feet, using your legs and your arms in a coordinated fashion. These are all skills that are coordinated, like playing the piano or learning a violin. This is a set of discipline skills that, that come together and enable you to do something at, at a higher level. That's what the discipline of strategic doing is, is a set of interrelated skills. And so I would argue that, that we've been way too loose in how we talk about collaboration. We've just been too, we think about a collaboration. If you ask people, hey, are you a good collaborator? People, most people would say, oh yeah, I'm good, I'm good. But they, they're really not. Uh, you know, that we have natural collaborators in our companies and our organizations. But unfortunately, the natural collaborators get burned out because they're naturally collaborative. <laughs> a lot of people, and a lot of people aren't very good collaborators. It sounds like it is quite exhausting to be actually a good collaborator, a natural one. Yeah, a natural one. Uh, some some natural collaborators are, are, you know, they do it by second nature. I was a natural collaborator. That's how I built my consulting practice. But it took me a long time to figure out what's the implicit knowledge, what's the intuition, the experience that I've accumulated, and how do I make that explicit? In other words, how do I communicate that to someone else? And then how do I teach that? And it required us to develop very precise language around strategy. We discarded a lot of language around strategy. And then the second we had to do is we had to develop a visual language because it's complex. It's, it's not rocket science. It's harder. It's harder than rocket science. It's, it's more like molecular biology. You're trying to manage networks that you can't see. You don't see them. So it's not, it's not rocket science. It's harder. And so... Um, but the truth is that you can, you, you can, like a molecular biologist, you can start to create and, and design and manage these networks. Uh, if you change the way you think, change perhaps sometimes, change the way you behave and uh, change the way you do the work. So if you shift your thinking uh, and practice, you can be much more effective at it. Uh -huh. It's good that you put it into a process and, you know, you're able to teach it because that's like the basis of being able to teach anything, put something in a structure and a process and be able to repeat it all over again. So as you mentioned, you were a natural, but actually to implement, to invent the whole process, it must have been quite a, quite a journey. <laughs> that that journey, because part of this is running these test beds at Purdue. In order for the model to work, we had to run the model in a variety of different situations, basically the same model in a variety of different situations to see if it works. So we had to work with NASA. We had to work with Lockheed, big, sophisticated organizations. But we also had to work with community organizations that deal with really complex problems like, I don't know, teenage homicides and, and infant mortality and uh, opioid poisoning. I mean, these are, these are really complex problems and there's no hierarchy. So how do you develop a strategy in that environment? And what we learned was that so we could teach this, teach this discipline to community activists, people in the neighborhood with not, not high levels of, you know, advanced education, but we could also teach it to NASA scientists and, uh, you know, engineers and faculty at Purdue and, and so without changing the model. And so this is, this is how we learned to refine the model down so that you don't change it the bit then depending on the, on the context. It's just basically the same model. And so if I might, I'll tell you one story. When I realized we had... Yeah, go ahead. Well, um, I was working, this was about 2016 or 17. I was working with Lockheed. And Lockheed was asking us, how do we develop for the Navy, for the U.S. Navy, a technology roadmap for the deployment of condition-based maintenance or predictive maintenance across the Aegeus destroyer fleet. The Navy's asked us to develop this technology roadmap, but we don't have the technologies, all the technologies in-house. We don't have the latest sensor technology. We don't have the latest UI designers. We don't have uh, uh, data scientists that are, you know, up on the, on machine learning. So we're going to have to bring in other companies that are able to help us. And so, um, Todd Tangert, who was the, the engineer I was working with, was, was struggling with this problem. At the same time, I was struggling with a, working with a 
community activist in Flint, Michigan. Now, Flint is a is the home the the the, the home base of of General Motors. That's where General Motors started. But it's been in the news in the last five, 10 years because it's it's been one of these industrial communities left behind. And it's impoverished and it's, you know, had problems with its water system. But the challenge I was dealing with or we were dealing with is how do we reduce teenage homicides, kids killing each other? How do we do that? And uh, Kenyatta Dotson was the leader there. And so I was talking to Kenyatta and um, and Todd in the same week, talking about the same model, talking about the same discipline. And I realized, okay, now we have it. If we can teach Kenyatta Dotson this model and Todd Tangert this model and not deviate from it, uh, and we can we can teach them a new way of thinking about strategy uh, in this really ambiguous, difficult <clears throat> environment, then uh, we have it. And, and that's when I decided that we could write a book. So that is a good start. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And you also mentioned the aspect of conversation being at the basis of good collaboration. Are there any like, specific rules of conversation that actually would help people collaborate better that you could share with us? Sure, of course. Uh, part of it is understanding that <clears throat> collaboration emerges out of conversations with a very predictable structure. So if you understand the structure, then you can figure out where your conversation is. You can design your conversation before you even have it. You can design it. You can guide it with questions. And then you can you can use that conversation to generate experiments, move ideas into action. So one of the key first rules of conversation is that you're going to have a deeper conversation. It's not going to be a shallow conversation. It's not going to be a, an abstract conversation. It's going to run a deeper at a deeper level. And in order to do that, you do have to create an environment of psychological safety. And this is a concept that um, Amy Edmondson has been working on for 20 or 25 years now. But psychological safety means that people are feel comfortable enough to do the deep thinking, share thoughts. And so you're going to have a complex conversation, but you can't have it unless you create an environment in which people feel safe in the sense that they can raise issues, think their minds, uh, share what they're thinking, pay a, and not penalty for that or pay a cost for that. The second dimension of that safe space or creating a safe space is trying to flatten the power hierarchies. Now, I'll explain that in, in a minute. When we were at Purdue, we were trying to introduce uh, strategic doing into the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue, which is a nationally great recognized school. There's a big hierarchy within that camp, within that college, within that school, between named professors at the top of the hierarchy and students at the bottom of the hierarchy. And uh, well, arguably staff might be lower than students in terms of hierarchy. But the point of that is that that if you if you try to have a conversation where the hierarchy influences the conversation, you're not going to get your best thinking done. So if if people are afraid to talk in front of named professors, then they're not going they're they're not going to share what they think and what they do. So you have to create rules that enable people to flatten that hierarchy just for the just for the purpose of your conversation. Not you're not trying to change the organization. You're just saying for the purpose of this conversation, everybody's equal. Everybody we're going to treat everybody equally, and. Um, Nobody's going to dominate the conversation. Everybody's going to speak about equally. Uh, and these are rules that you can create. And that's all embedded in the first rule of strategic doing is creating a safe space. Okay. A second rule, which is really tricky, but it's, it's an important one, is to frame the conversation with a question. What's the question you're, what's the inquiry? What are you trying to, what are you trying to solve? What's the problem you're trying to solve? But don't frame that in terms of a problem. Frame it in terms of an opportunity. In other words, if you solve this problem, what's the end state that you're going to get to? What's the, what's the outcome that you're going to get to? Why do you want to solve this problem? What's, how is life going to be better? What are people going to think, do, feel that it's going to be different because of that? Because what we've learned is that people move in the direction of their conversations. And if you point them toward an, toward an opportunity then they'll start to share what they're visualizing as that future state is. And that's really what you want to do is you want to 
create this collective visualization of what the future is. And as you do that, people become engaged. People say, oh, that's interesting. I'll, I'll be. However, if you deal with these really complex problems and you start out trying to define the problem, all you're going to do is spend all your time defining the problem. You're not trying to, you know, you're going to argue about the root, quote, the root cause of the problem. Well, you know, what's the root cause of the pandemic? I mean, we don't know. We still don't know. <laughs> you know, we, we've been arguing about it for a long time. No idea if we ever know. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. What's the root cause of, of teen violence? What's the root cause of, of, of opioid addiction? Well, I mean, you can point to all sorts of contributing causes, and that's what makes the problem wicked. So if you get into trying to figure out the problem with a technical mindset, in other words, I'm an engineer, I'm going to deconstruct this problem, uh, you're going to get into trouble. So one of the key elements that managers have to think about when they're confronting a problem, is this a, what Karl Popper, Karl Popper was a philosopher of science. He talked about the difference between a clock problem and a cloud problem. A clock problem, you can take apart a clock. It's mechanistic. It's linear. You can figure it out. It's a, you know, cloud problems are indeterminate. They're like wicked problems. They're indeterminate. They're vague. We're not sure. So if you're dealing with a clock problem, you can figure it out go do root cause analysis, figure that out, go do it. However, we're dealing with more and more cloud problems. And if you apply root cause analysis to a cloud problem, you're going nowhere. You're going to go nowhere. Instead, what you want to do with a cloud problem is imagine a future state. What's, what's the future state that we want to drive toward? What's the future we want to guide ourselves toward? And that is what we call a framing question. Imagine if, what would it look like if? And that's what you're trying to encourage people to imagine this future state because you want to design a system that eliminates the symptoms of the problem that you're experiencing. So you want to design a system. Imagine if every child in Flint could walk home feeling safe. All right, you want to design a system in that community where kids feel safe walking home from school. So what are the churches going to do? What are the families going to do? What are the, what's the school going to do? You know, what are, what are people going to do to create that system? And that's really what you want to do. So you're designing a new system that, that eliminates the symptoms of the old system. Mm -hmm. So on the ha one hand, I would say like creating the frame of the rules within the conversation to create the safe space. But on the other hand, to create the discussion in such a way that it's like more solution oriented than problem oriented and make it in a positive opportunity wise uh, direction. Right. And those two rules, those two rules create the container for your conversation. This, the, these are the contain, this is the container for your conversation. So you can design these before you even have a conversation. You can think about it and design, how am I going to deal with this? So that that's what, that's what typically I do is I think about, okay, well, how am I going to design, design this conversation to focus on the collaboration, focus on what we could mm -hmm. do together? And so I would we, even go one, one step further that it is necessary to actually consider it first for the conversation to be successful it, it, and reach it, its aim. Right. It is primarily because you're not doing this on a clean slate. Usually people have had a, an experience or they have a, history or a pattern of bad conversations. And, you know, how do I know that? Well, how, mu how many times do we talk about the fact that, you know, employees are disengaged? You know, they're, they're, they're disengaged. Or how many times have we, we tried to calculate how much time do we waste in meetings? You know, these are situations where we are wasting our attention, our brain power, which is the most valuable resource we have. And we're, we're wasting it. And, and, and time. Yeah, and time. Yeah, exactly. Which is irreplaceable, like literally. <laughs> exactly. And so these are the things that we're wasting, and we're wasting them at an enormous rate. So this brings up another point, which is important from a managerial standpoint, which is if you learn and share these skills of how do you do collaborations, what we see is a step change improvement in productivity. In other words, you're utilizing your assets far more effectively. People's time, the resources you have. And I'm not talking about 10% improvements 
15% improvement. So I'm talking about 2x, 3x improvements in productivity because you're aligning people toward a shared outcome. And um, you're using conversation, this technology we have, uh, you're using conversation to align people toward a shared outcome. And then you're learning, you're continuously learning uh, by doing. So uh, that's really the, the essence of strategic doing is, is teaching you the skills of designing a strategy process using conversation as your technology. I see. And when you look at the community of C-level executives who implemented the strategy doing in their organizations, you already mentioned a few, but what are other benefits of actually making this step of implementing it? Well, I think, I think it, one, it's, it's a lot more fun. It's a lot more enjoyable. I mean, it, oh, <laughs> That's a good argument. <laughs> it, you know, I, I think people, humankind wants to connect and wants to align. And, and I think part of the, that I, I say the reason strategic doing is spreading globally is because people have fun doing it. They, they, they feel, they feel better about the meetings that they have because they're having, they're, they're answering these two key questions of strategy. There's two key questions of strategy. Where are we going? In other words, what's the outcome we want to get to? And then the second quite key question is how will we get there? In other words, what's the experiment? What's the path that we're going to start on to see if we can get there? Because we can't predict the future, but we can shape it. We can shape the future. And so part of the challenge of of doing this is guiding strategy with these two key questions and then using the conversation, designing a strategic conversation to answer these two questions, to answer these two questions. And part of that conversation is going to be divergent. Part of it's going to be brainstorming. What could we do? But a large part of it's convergent, which is what should we do? Of all the things we could do, what should we do? What's the one thing we should do? Now let's figure out that. And then what will we do? What will we do? In other words, setting up an action plan and setting up a regular time buckets to review your plan and doing it in a simple way. So, so the, the beauty of strategic doing is it takes a lot of the, you know, the pain of strategic planning and basically says, that's eh, not, not quite as critically important as we had before. And so, you know, you can do strategic doing with strategic planning if you want to, you can do that. But, but increasingly, I think the organizations of the future will do their strategic thinking and doing uh, in a much more guided way, in a much more inclusive way, and in a much more aligned way. And the job of top management is to align those conversations, is to, to frame, the con frame the big conversations and then align conversations throughout the organization toward those outcomes, those shared outcomes that you want to get to. And so no longer is strategy this process where just a handful of people at the top of the organization does all the thinking and then assumes that everybody else is going to do the doing. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. What does work is to engage everybody in the strategic conversation and to shape those conversations, use your management authority to shape the conversations and set up expectations and use transparency to, um, to generate metrics all along the way. And so one of the, one of the aspects of strategic doing that people start to recognize is that generating a lot of data about what works, what could work. And so we use metrics somewhat differently than you would in strategic planning. And so this is an interesting, probably sidelight that might be valuable. In strategic yeah, planning, could you actually elaborate on that? Yeah. So in strategic planning, you a small group of people at the top, and I'm do this is a paradigm. So it's just you know, a small group of people at the top of the organization set set a set of metrics. Set a set. Okay, here's what we're going to do, and I'm going to measure the people below me to make sure that they're aligned with what I'm doing. So, you know, this is the essence of a command and control system. I'm going to give you the metrics and then I'm going to follow whether or not you're following what we're supposed to be doing. And of course, the person who did this extremely to the, to an extreme extent was Jack Welch at General Electric. And I happened to be a consultant with General Electric in the early 80s. And so I saw the fallacy of this approach. Because if you put, if you do that, 
then all you're doing is creating incentives for people to game the system. And that's really what happened at General Electric is that people gamed the system. They focused on the metrics, but they gamed the metrics. And so you ended up, and at the end of the day, uh, that process destroyed the company. In strategic doing, we use metrics differently. We have two types of metrics. One are outcome metrics. You know, what's the future going to look like? What does success look like? How are we going to measure it? And the second are progress metrics. I'm going to do this by June. I'm going to do this by July. I'm going to do that. So what we have is teams setting their own metrics that are aligned to a large-scale metric framework that the top management sets up a metric framework, but then encourages teams to say, how will you help us move these four core or five core metrics that we want to move? The whole organization, how do we, how do we move toward that? And the team will in addition to at least one of those metrics, they'll start to come up with their own metrics of success that's appropriate to their context, appropriate to what they're trying to do. And they use these metrics to learn what works. They learn, the, so they're using metrics differently. They're not imposed from above, they're aligned from above. They're not imposed from above, they're all, everybody's aligning to these metrics. And you're then encouraging teams to develop their own metrics to figure out what works because you don't know what works. You, nobody knows what's going to align. And so what we find is that we have end up with large scale deployments where people are using a lot of metrics and they're self-generated metrics and they're trying to figure out, okay, well, is this getting us to this or are we, are we out, off what, whack? Because if we're off whack, so we got to change things. We got to change, change the way we're doing this. And this is the essence of adaptation of how an organization adapts is, is infusing a culture, a mindset of learning throughout the organization. And, and you can do this if you guide the conversations and you have a discipline of simple rules to follow. So don't, don't manage complexity with complexity, which is sort of what we're dealing with strategic planning, but man, manage it with simplicity, manage it with simple rules that people can understand. And that is what gets you alignment and engagement. And so that's mm -hmm. how strategic doing differs. I see. And from what you were saying, what really resonated with me is that the fact that people are involved in the, in the conversations, they actually feel responsible for the decisions they make throughout the conversation, throughout the collaboration. And at the end, as you mentioned, they feel engaged, which is like the best possible outcome, I guess, <laughs> Well, um, this kind of. Yeah. So I think the, the reason we're not moving faster to that is, is you know, in my experience is, is, uh, is fear, is fear. Top management fears, okay, if I let go of this current system, then it's going to be chaos. You know, if I let go, it will be chaotic and I'll, and I'll pay a price. I'll pay a short-term price for this, uh, being irresponsible or whatever. Um, but what strategic doing does says no, you're, you, there's an alternative method here. You don't have to move lock, stock, and barrel over to this new method. Start out, experiment with it, grow it internally within your organization. It's an organic process. Grow it. Uh, and you'll find that, one, you'll get more engagement with people. Two, your productivity will go up. Three, it doesn't cost much. You don't have to hire an outside consultant to do it. And so you, you're going to end up being having a much more uh, adaptive and lean organization, fast-moving organization than you did in the past. But you, if you don't start, if you don't start, recognize that you're on an S-curve and the S-curve is peaking. And if you don't start, the chances are your organization will collapse or will eventually go down, which is what happened to General Electric. I mean, they lost their innovating capacity. Well, not all of it, but you know, so, you know, there's mm -hmm. units that are still quite quite successful. But um, if you take appliances, for example, GE appliances are now owned by Hire over in China, and uh, that that's where I was working. I was working in GE appliances, and if you had this hierarchical model, it didn't work. It didn't work. But Hire, who has a much flatter more networked based approach, team based approach is making it work. And so it's, it's the way in which you approach these challenges that uh, matters. Wow, Ed, that was a blast. <laughs> Thank you for all the insights you shared with us today. It was great to learn 
a completely new approach to uh, collaboration, to conversations. So thank you again <laughs> for sharing that with, with us and our audience. And also thank you, our audience, for listening to another episode of IT Insights. Stay tuned for more. Thank you. Visit us at itinsights.tech and dive into our podcasts, webinars, and events.